Okay, everyone, I think we'll start uh, as it's quarter past 11 in the UK and quarter past 12 probably where everybody else is. Can everyone hear me? Can I see some nodding of heads if you can hear me? Okay, great. Um, so good afternoon. Welcome to the workshop. Um, I'm Gail Cardew. I'm a senior advisor at Science Business um, and also I'm an expert in the interface between science and society. So technology sovereignty is a term that's increasingly being used by the Commission and by other senior policymakers in Europe. Uh, but what exactly does it mean? Um, so Wikipedia, if you go onto Wikipedia, it defines it as a term uh, that's a political outlook that information and communication infrastructure and technology is aligned to the laws, needs and interests of the country in which users are located. Also, the Fraunhofer Institute have written a very interesting and helpful paper on technology sovereignty that was published last July, and they define it as the ability of a state or a federation of states to provide the technologies it, needs, it deems critical for its welfare, competitiveness and ability to act and to be able to develop these or source them from other economic areas without one sided structural dependency. And I think that is a very useful starting point um, for this definition. However, in preparation for this project, over the last few months, I've reached out to maybe 50 or so people um, across the whole spectrum from academics, SMEs, small companies and global companies. And nearly everyone has called it a fuzzy topic with uncertainties expressed about the policy implications that arise from it and what's needed to deliver it if indeed it is the right solution to the perceived problem. Many organizations are therefore still working on how technology sovereignty might change their R&D strategies. And some are fearful that without a common understanding of what it is and what it actually means in practice, undesirable elements might creep in under the slogan. So that's kind of my introduction. This is a working session, it's a workshop. And what we would like to get out of it are two to three recommendations that we will synthesize with all the other recommendations from the other workshops. And we will put them to Jean-Éric Paquet, uh, Director General of Research and Innovation at the European Commission, later on this afternoon. And given the uncertainties around the points I just raised, um, what we will try to focus on in this discussion is um, an agreement, if we can, of what technology sovereignty is for everyone across all the different sectors. We have around 20 people that are online now, but we have around 30 people that have registered for this, um, this session. And I can tell you that looking at everyone, you all come from quite different uh, sectors um, and industries and, and, and academics. We'll also agree, um, if we can, on some of the elements that we don't want technology sovereignty to be. So, so what, what is it? What isn't it, it? And what might it be for certain sectors? And if we have time, we'll also delve into what the implications are for all of us and what needs to happen next to ensure clarity across the sector and optimum benefit for all of us. So, in preparation to for this sector to this session and to kind of kick everything off, I've asked three individuals to give us their thoughts on the above statements. They'll speak for around three minutes each, and then they will briefly comment on each other's thoughts. And then we will open it up to all of you. I uh, just want to remind that this session is being recorded. So everything that you might say or comment is on the record um, and could be in the public domain. Um, and if you want to raise a point, if you want to ask a question or just make a comment, if you will feel very strongly about something that someone has said, then use the chat function on the left hand side. You just need to write in your comment. But please also indicate if you would like to join the discussion um, yourself and introduce your point or your question yourself. Um, and then we'll um, unmeet, unmute you and invite you to speak at the appropriate moment. So I hope everything is clear. Um, so now we'll start off with uh, Christina Gomlik, who's the deputy head of the Berlin office, corporate government relations at BASF. Christina, could you unmute yourself, please, um, and start speaking? Thank you.
I hope Christina is there. Hmm. Okay. Okay, so Christina doesn't have a very good connection, so she may be having problems connecting. So while she's connecting, maybe we can start with Andreas. With Andreas Tag, would you? Would you? Are you there? Can I see you? Yeah, I can. I'm here. Can start. That's fantastic. Um, so Andreas Tag is the head of global government relations at SAP. Would you like to start the discussions? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Gail, and hello, everybody. I really look forward to this discussion on technology sovereignty. And as you know, as you certainly know, within this debate, uh, there's a strong focus on digital sovereignty, a debate that SAP, my company, is closely following, and I will focus my intervention on digital sovereignty. Um, now, the reason why European policymakers across all party lines uh, basically focus so much on digital sovereignty these days, I think it's twofold. Number one, a growing understanding of the importance of digital infrastructures or services for the functioning of society and the economy, as we recently learned through the COVID crisis, where digital basically kept the society and economy running. And combined with the fact that uh, key components, key platforms, infrastructure and services are controlled by non-European providers and providers that are headquartered in countries and are govern governed by rules that are not necessarily in line with European rules and standards. So I think this combination uh, brings us to, you know, the, the the reason why there's so much focus on it. And that relates to the concerns uh, that are out there, and I think brings us to a definition of digital sovereignty. So the current concerns are, first of all, the concern that personal data of European citizens are not processed according to European legal and legal standards and values. Secondly, there's a concern of espionage, basically that sensitive business data of European companies gets into the hands of foreign governments and or foreign competitors. Thirdly, there are competition issues, um, concern that dominant foreign platform providers use their dominant position and uh, discriminate against actual and potential European competitors. And finally, more recently, the risk that European users may be locked out from essential um, digital facilities, um, that's another concern that was recently raised. I think that brings us to a kind of a definition, a bit similar to what Gail just mentioned. I would define it as uh, digital sovereignty is the ability of, of a state to provide, to ensure access to essential digital facilities, infrastructures and services to the, to the population. And secondly, to ensure that the data of citizen, business, and government is processed according to rules and values that have defined have been defined by this government. So that's a bit long, but I think that captures this quite well. Now, um, I think there's nothing wrong with digital sovereignty as an objective, but obviously there's a thin line between digital sovereignty and protectionism. So you have to look at the actual policy measures to establish its objective. Until recently, the European Commission or the EU in general has focused on a, on a rules-based approach to ensure digital sovereignty, based EU regulation to ensure that European values and standards are kept within the digital economy. It started with GDPR for personal data. Another example is recently on cybersecurity measures to ensure cybersecurity for 5G on the infrastructure layer, and we expect further regulation for artificial intelligence, for platforms, and uh, and other stuff. So this is a rules-based approach, and you can argue, we don't agree with everything the Commission is doing in this area, but I think you cannot argue this is protectionist, because these rules apply to both European and non-European providers. But obviously, the debate has shift, shifted recently. Uh, but now, within the renaissance of industrial policy, there's now a focus on building European capacities, digital capacities, to ensure digital sovereignty, partly because there's a view that the policy approach, the rules-based approach alone, is not sufficient. The idea is that you cannot really effectively 
regulate foreign providers. Also in a system where the rules-based global trading system is about to collapse. So the focus is now on increasing European technology capabilities to ensure digital sovereignty. Again, there's nothing wrong with building a strong, with the objective of building a strong European ICT industry. We have to look at the measures again. I think we all would probably agree that creating framework conditions for European ICT companies to scale and, and, and succeed in Europe, there's nothing wrong with this, like completing the digital single market, advancing digital skills, or making data, be it public business data or whatever, available for new dis business models in Europe, nothing wrong with this. There's probably nothing wrong with increasing public funding for R&D. Uh, or creating incentives for digital investment, tax incentives, etc. But I think the moment where you try to create digital champions or subsidies for concrete companies, then I think you enter into the wrong approach. That may work in other industries. I think aerospace was one example that is always quoted, but in the digital industry, so dynamic, probably it's a recipe for failure and a waste of taxpayers' money. And finally, I think the EU should refrain from uh, foreclose foreign companies to enter the European market as long as they play by the European rules, because European citizens, European business, they need the best technology, access to the best technology wherever it's being produced. And we should not foreclose the EU market because this was just give arguments for other regions. How can we convince China and other regions to open their markets if we close our markets? So to conclude, I think the key question when it comes to the definition and the assessment of digital sovereignty, is the rules-based approach sufficient? Or do we need to focus on building our own capabilities? And if so, what's the borderline to protectionism? Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Andreas, for kicking us off. Do we have Christina back? She keeps um, dropping in and out. So. Christina, are you there? Yes, um, I'm back. Um, sorry, um, for some reason, um, the beginning of the conference was a little too much for my um, network here. Um, yeah, um, I'm afraid I didn't really get everything um, you just said, Andreas. I'm just well, probably just going to have to start out again. Um, <clears throat> but um, the interesting thing about technical sovereignty is actually that I never really questioned technological sovereignty for us as an industry or for us um, as, as EU or Germany until quite recently, actually. And um, I think that's an interesting observation that we never really thought about technological sovereignty until now, except maybe um, when it comes to military technologies. Um, where in the past technological sovereignty always was an issue um, for, um, yeah, for, for, for individual states. And um, now we have this, um, this, this, this changing geopolitical framework. We have um, US versus China and, um, and us in the middle, maybe also Russia somewhere in the equation. We have um, a new definition of, of, or not a new definition, but um, we have globalization um, changing and our understanding of globalization. We have um, rules-based trade breaking down, um, as um, Andreas already pointed out. So um, yeah, now, now technological sovereignty is also on the agenda for us as an industry um, when it comes to accessing manufacturing parts or um, know-how for, for our business in general. So um, I know that technological sovereignty, of course, is an issue for states. But of course, um, for businesses, um, it also is an extremely important framework condition for us. It's part, basically, of our license to operate. Um, that we, and um, so, so, so for us, technological sovereignty is actually a policy goal. Um, and it is the result of many factors. It, um, it boils down probably to the definition that you found in the um, Fraunhofer paper, um, which is basically the ability to access um, the technology necessary for us to enable our business um, and, and to do that um, at a reasonable cost um, and um, to do that reliably. 
so that we don't have to feel disruption um, of the um, of the of the technology or parts of the, of the supply of the technology or the parts um, that we need to do our business. So it's about um, yeah supply security, I guess, and it's also about security in in the actual sense that these parts that we get are safe, and it's about um, continuity, of course, of the access. Um, and um, that boils down, yeah, to the issue of open markets and um, also the global level playing field, um, which um, w which then, of course, is yeah, is is the whole trade um, question that we're posing. And there's also another um, word um, which also is which we also hear in this context, which is sovereignty, because sovereignty is all about borders. It implies land. Um, it implies nations. But it's also about autonomy. Um, and the question, how far can we actually do things ourselves or need to do it ourselves? And um, the EU just put this forward in their um, trade strategy review when it comes to the term of the open strategic autonomy, which I think somehow interrelates to this question of technological sovereignty too. Yeah, but it's not about, um, but, but it's not only about um, the ability to access technologies, um, which would be the first point. I think technological sovereignty is also about the ability to create the technologies necessary where access is not possible or we may also need to have additional access to um well for um, to to a technology to create competition um and um, this is also where the framework conditions in a certain market come into play and that there, then we're um, speaking about industrial policy of course and um, the way we shape our policy and the technologies that are fostered by the governments or that competition fosters um, in, in, in the different member states of the EU or in a nation. And of course, we're talking about innovation policy and the way innovation is fostered um, by, well, by a sovereign, in this case, um, in the EU. And then, of course, we're also talking about the regulatory red tape, which makes it more often, more often than not very difficult for us to actually develop the technologies that we need within a reasonable time frame for us. Um, so, um, yeah, in, 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 um, that, that for me would be my definition of technology sovereignty, um, ability to access and ability to create, um, and that at a reasonable cost, securely and on a level playing field within the normal framework conditions that industrial policy and innovation policy makes possible for us as a company. Thank you. Terrific, thank you. I can see we're going to have problems just synthesizing this down to two, three points, <laughs> because both of you have mentioned so many things already. Um, so, Chira Parkinen, you're the third speaker. You're from um, uh, Vice President of Partnerships Europe at Meru Health. Chira, would you like to give us your thoughts too, please? Yes, uh, thanks. Uh, so, yes, we're a mental health company that I'm working for currently, and there are certain aspects of this that are very relevant to us, but I'm also kind of approaching this from my uh, previous, uh, say, more intensive area of passion of economics, and the other one is of that of language, and the power and, and dangers of language, and, and kind of, of maybe I can start with that more meta-level uh, angle that that if we are going to come up with some discussion, kind of suggestions on what this concept of technological sovereignty means and what we don't want it to mean. Maybe we also kind of need to take a stance of, do we want to recommend using this term at all? Uh, because I'd like to kind of suggest that the proposition that um, some words are dangerous and, and maybe should not be used at all. Not because uh, the ideas should be suppressed or censored or anything, but because they might actually defacilitate a constructive discussion. I'm not, I'm not saying that for 100% certainty for this word, but I'm putting that forth as a possibility. Um, for example, well, of course, one thing is that if if a concept is too fuzzy and we have a kind of we might easily have an illusion of consensus and we think we're talking about the same thing, well, actually we're talking about very different things with the same word. And even if we manage to actually clearly define a word, uh, we can still have kind of dangers in it that a word can lump in implicitly many different things together. And I think that based on the previous uh, openings already, we could actually see that this looks to be the case in this situation. Um, and also, words can have such strong negative or positive connotations or emotional charges more specifically that they can actually prevent us from seeing the threats or the opportunities in something and just implicitly assuming that they're all good or assuming that they're all bad. And Or they can actually implicitly include a whole theory. One of my favorite examples is the word, of, word inflation, which seems harmless on the top, 
uh, but it actually kind of etymologically comes from the idea of something expanding. While in economics, it just means the purchasing power of a, of a currency unit going down. So it kind of implicitly includes the whole quantity theory of money, which in my opinion is the most idiotic theory mankind has ever come up with. But it's kind of implicitly assumed that kind of this existence of this simple word sustains this one theory and its unquestionable uh, position in economic discussion, kind of an out of context analogy here. And the same kind of thing is what I can see here with this technological sovereignty is that it's lumping together many things and kind of policy goals for which the, the means might actually be contradicting. Something that is actually good for one aspect of it might be detrimental for another aspect. So uh, the way I've heard it, sovereignty seems to include the idea of resilience in terms of like our technical access to technical infrastructure or technical resources, but also means control or power uh, in general. And it also has this completely kind of distinct aspect of data security and integrity and especially the, let's say, the sovereignty of the individual over their own personal data, uh, which is kind of a different thing than a kind of more nation level, let's say, so technological sovereignty, though it's easily kind of to conflate these things because you can use the same word for it. And then there's the overall idea of competitiveness or superiority uh, in business or technological capabilities. And let's say, for example, with resilience and control, the, the, the policies might be contradicting. So in many cases, uh, control would mean that you want everything for yourself and you want everything to be made in one place and you want to be fully self-sufficient. Whereas for resilience, it might be better to aim for like distribution and having more redundancies and having actually less control for everyone, for anyone at all. So um, for a kind of con constructive discussion, it might be actually more useful to avoid these kinds of overarching terms and just go very specifically to what are the actual concerns that we're tackling because the solutions might actually be very different for, for different ends. Um, and for us, especially for example, for, um, for um, Mero Health, we are a mental health care company. So for us, data security, especially in terms of healthcare data, uh, is a very central question. But for that end, like as uh, Andreas well noted, like does that Ensuring that does that require more control for European states over uh, technology? Not necessarily. It can be enforced, for example, with stricter like rule-based approaches to, to protect that. So we can have like good data security and, and uh, patient security without necessarily trying to reach that through stricter control or power uh, for European states over technology platforms. So that's an important thing. Um, for us, we're an interesting case as a company in the sense that uh, we are mostly operating in the US. Most of our customers are there, uh, but we're doing almost all of our actual development work in Finland. And uh, that's not a political kind of data or technology sovereignty statement. It's just the fact that uh, the kind of, let's say, the quality and price ratio of tech talent is, is a bit better in, the, in Finland than in Silicon Valley. Uh, currently, so and that's where originally from. So we have a we have kind of a good network here to continue building a good product team here. Um, but for example, from that kind of end, if if we end up with this very kind of strong political tension where every continent or group of nations is focusing on being self-sufficient, that might be very detrimental for companies like us that are trying to serve the United States from Europe. Um, which definitely would be detrimental towards these kinds of, let's say, policy goals of improving European competitiveness in the technology space. And of course, we want to be able to utilize many of the great services and infrastructure that come from the United States as well. Um, and kind of, it's, it's very clear that if, if we embarked on this kind of protectionist or kind of control oriented path, it would definitely hamper development and definitely hamper this other goal of, let's say, competitiveness that, that European nations seem to have. And um, from just a kind of another interesting note, from a, from a Finnish perspective, from Finland, we're a small nation uh, that has historically had a very lo long border with one um, large, powerful nation in the East. And that's why self-sufficiency has been always important for us. We mostly focused on that, like in terms of food and energy, and actually with personal protective equipment, we had a slightly better situation than many other countries because of that. But in technology, we actually never, we haven't had that much of a, a focus on it. And there the focus has just been on the exports. So 
stall farm. We're always looking for the next Nokia. And uh, and yes, if the focus goes too much on on kind of control and and uh, and kind of achieving more power in the global arena, then we likely will not have a next Nokia here either. So um, I, I haven't actually talked to any Finnish politicians about this, but it would actually be interesting to hear what they're how they've been perceiving the discussion uh, in the European circles on this these debates. Uh, but overall, it's it kind of it seems that this technological sovereignty is not a concept; it's it's more of a title for some set of strategies, and uh, it's very easy to sneak a lot of um, very different things under the same umbrella uh, by redefining other concepts in the in the process. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, um, as I said, that I'll I'll give a few minutes for the other speakers to react on. You've had the advantage of going last, so you can incorporate some of what they've said into your talks. But um, Andreas and Christina, would you like to join in? So, if all three speakers could unmute themselves, <clears throat> and we'll have a few a few minutes just to react on some of the points that that um, you've raised, and then I invite it to everyone to speak. So. Meanwhile, everybody else, I see that we have 26 people registered for, for this. So if you could just, you know, think about what's being said, uh, maybe comment or, or ask questions in the chat function to your left, um, that would be great. Um, so speakers, please, please join in and, and let's have a little three way conversation. Yeah, I, I like uh, you. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I, I just wanted to underline what Christina mentioned um, that you know if we, if we turn this around, that dependencies was never a problem. Actually, if you think about economic theory and global supply chain, global trade, uh, where each nation or each company focuses on what they can do best and then rely on others to complement, that's basic economics. That's that's how the whole global trading systems, you know, where, where everybody benefits, right? But of course, this only works if there's a rules-based approach that you can rely on on everything that you can plan, that you have legal certainty. And this is this is about to collapse with the rise of China, China, with conflicts between the U.S. and Europe. So I think that's we need to make this very clear. That's the reason, right? And there's very little we can do about this. And the second point I wanted to make is, yes, uh, it's a fairly new concept from a European perspective. We never really thought about this. But the issue of technological sovereignty is not new. It was in the past, it was a north-south dimension where developing countries raised the issue that they were dependent from foreign technology. But what is new, I believe, is that this is now within the OECD framework an issue. That, I think that's the new element really. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I, I like the um, the last aspect um, that um, sorry that um, um, sorry not Andreas. I'm sorry, I can't see the names. Excuse me. Um, um, that 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 my um, yeah my, my Finnish co speaker said um, that basically we're talking about a um, yeah a set of strategies which is um, 